photorealism work depended heavily on photographs. Their work strive to replicate with microscopic precision what cameras were capable of and beyond. Their references were photographs, which before had never been used professionally for fine art, but was prevalent in commercial art. No alibis, no depth, keeping to the surface of things, examining without emphasis, favoring no one quality. Thomas Albright, Critic. Formative stages. Malcolm Morley's ocean liner painting shows glimpses of photorealism. If you look to your right, you'll see a boat. That's quite a big boat. It's so real. <laughs> I would like to dive into that. But you can't forget about Robert Bechtel. Nope. Take a look at that triptych, him and his family. Robert Bechtel's work on suburbia was a commentary on where he lived. Well, all of us, that is. This made me question, are all photorealists asking these simple yet existential questions? Photorealism really sets in with Chuck Close's Big Self Portrait. Hey, did you know that New York and California were its epicenters? No, I didn't. That's so interesting. Did you even do this project? Of course I did! Really? Yes. How did you not know that? Well, I do now. Lewis K. Meisel in 1969 coined the name photorealism. Lewis K. Meisel said that photorealism is the creation of paintings fashioned in such a way as to appear to be photographs in their finished form. According to Meisel, you must have these qualities to be a photorealist painter. You must use cameras and photos as primary sources. You must use mechanical and semi-mechanical means to transfer the information to the cameras. The work must seem as if it was a photograph. You must have exhibited work as a photorealist by 1972. And developed five or more years of painting and showing photorealistic artwork. I don't believe I fulfill any of these qualities. Wouldn't some people see this as cheating? I don't know. In its meticulous techniques and objective rendering of surface appearance, photorealism has a long line of historical predecessors, stretching from veristic surrealism in 19th century academic paintings back to 17th century Dutch paintings, and further to the works of Van van Eyck. Jan van Eyck. There we go. Pop art heavily influenced photorealism. Pop art's images of mass-produced goods, suburban life, and the premise of replicating an existing artifact with no apparent comment can all be seen in many of the photorealist works. Some similar qualities include rejects elitism, appeals to many, and it's easily comprehended. And if you look to your right, you'll see a Roy Lichtenstein, which is a great example of pop art and photorealism. Some notable photorealists who paved the way, those are in air quotes, uh, Malcolm Morley, Chuck Close, Richard Estes, Audrey Flack, Robert Bechtel, Robert Cottingham, Richard McLean, Don Eddy, John Salt, Dwayne Hansen, and John Andrea. The top photo is a photo of Dwayne Hansen when he was alive, and the bottom one is of Don Eddy. He is alive. Photorealism is essentially an American art movement, so you could say it is the best art movement out there. So, America. Photographs are the primary reference. The goal is photorealistic actuation. Often included technical or pictorial challenges and they use materials used by commercial artists. And if you look to your right, you'll see a perfect example of commercial art. According to Guggenheim, uh, in some artists' works, the use of multiple photographic studies for each work transcended the limitations of the singular depth of field of conventional photography. A perfect example of this would be reflections that you can see 
in many photorealist photo works. Some things that are unique to photorealism or characteristics that can be realized as photorealism is that it gets rid of the stylization of artists and the humans in the work seem very detached. Also, the portraits were of ordinary people. They weren't famous or beautiful, and they had a sense of social observation. The process of creating a photorealist work is somewhat dehumanizing. It's, it's so exact that it's almost like you're the printer or you're the camera. Uh, the artist himself is dehumanized. But the finished piece is a recognition of true humanity. So is there a message to photorealist works? It's a hard question to answer. Well, there are satirical aspects and commentary that may be seen more in photorealistic sculptures. And photorealistic sculptors strive to reproduce real objects instead of photos. If you look to your right, that bag is not made out of leather. It's made out of some other materials that the artist has, you know, created to look like leather. Why would she do this? Another good question. <laughs> According to MoMA, despite frequent denials by the artists, choice of banal subjects with no centers of interest was almost inevitably read as a commentary on the hollowness of the, s of the society in which it derived. Such social references are made all the more specific through the sense of place and culture that pervades photoreali photorealistic works. Chuck Close once said, I stopped using myself as a model in my photographs after I entered my 30s. I figured out why later. In your 20s, you're not so conscious about yourself. Chuck Close's personal style had four layers of airbrushed paint, copy painting techniques of four color printers, and focused on visual elements such as shape, textures, volume, shadows, and highlights. It's important to note that the airbrushing technique was borrowed from commercial art. In 1988, a spinal cord injury left Chuck Close a quadriplegic. This led him to a new style of portraits. He began using grids to plan out which sections of the photograph would be certain colors. If you look to your left, you can see Chuck Close using the process that mimicked four color printers to create his giant portraits. And over time, he began leaving the sections of the lines on his pieces of work, which created a whole new style. They saw a portrait was a piece that put photorealism on the map. It's simply a portrait of Chuck Close, who, when he woke up one morning, he just took a picture of himself, and this is the result of that picture. Obviously, Chuck Close is not a beautiful, beautiful person, but it's very real to what he does look like. That's all that matters. Chuck Close's mark is a really well-known piece because, for one thing, his facial facial expression is very surprised and not what you would expect from a portrait. But he also captures like every pore on his face, every detail of his hair, and even the reflection in his glasses. And we'll see reflections come up later when we look at other photorealist pieces. Uh, Mark is in no way a good-looking person. <laughs> and but that's okay. Um, that just speaks to what Chuck Close was doing and what the photorealists were doing. Uh, much like Dwayne Hansen, who we'll, we will talk about later. Uh, those were every yeah. These were everyday people. people. These were normal people, and unlike pop artists, they focused on what life really is yeah. and what we see every day. Not celebrities and you know pop culture. Not name brands. Yeah.
Richard Estes once said, the abstract quality of reality is far more exciting than most of the abstract painting I see. Richard S. says originally wanted to go to school for architecture, but due to a trip he took to Europe, he missed the sign-up day where he could enroll for school. And instead of going to architecture, he went into art. So in 1952, he moved to Chicago and attended the Art Institute of Chicago where he got his degree. Uh, he moved in. He moved to New York City in 1958 and worked in illustration and graphic design, where he developed his skills as an artist. And later, he took some time off from those jobs and created his first series. Uh, at the time, Estes knew that he was not fitting into the art world, uh, but he just wanted to do what he wanted to do, and that was create photorealistic art. Uh, S has always thought that abstraction was one of his foundations, but it just wasn't enough for him. He he thought they were they were too too allowed, like they were allowed to make too many mistakes, and that was not who S was. Uh, in Estes's work, he takes multiple photographs of the settings of you know, of the subject, and he only creates the reality that you can see in his paintings, because each photograph is from a different spot, but he puts it all into one picture, so to actually go and see one of these places is impossible. Um, in his work, it's so precise that you look anywhere, and he's painted it with the exact precision of, of any focal point in the work. So it's drawing attention to the unseen pieces of our reality. Estes never works from projections, and he does all his drawings by hand. Richard Estes does not put political messages in his work because he doesn't believe that art should have politics in it. He says that the meaning of his work is in looking at his work. So that's like a more of a personal, you know, what you think personally of his art is what it means. Um, he usually suppresses human figures in his work and you can see that illustrated in the painting on the right. The person is in the bus window, but they are not as distinct as the bus itself or the car in front of the bus is, and they kind of just blend in. You can even see them reflected on the trunk of the car. Uh, one thing about Estes is that in person, when you see his works, you can tell that it's a painting. It's, you can tell that it's not a photograph. Although it may photograph like a photograph, it is clearly a painting. Richard Estes once said, I worked in advertising. That's where I started using photographs to make illustrations. I saw all the other people were doing it, all the other illustrators. They didn't put a model in front of them and make a careful drawing. Estes did not pay attention to what others were doing around him. This is pretty typical of the photorealist movement, which many people criticize as not being a movement because there was no collaboration or communication between the artists as they were creating these first works. Um, pop art was very popular at the time, and Estes could only say that pop art was just pop and that at least it had some realism in it, but um, he sees himself more as a classical artist who did not have cameras, but he does mention the device, the camera obscura, which is essentially the same thing as he's doing, which is drawing from an image that is put in front of you. So the camera, the camera obscura is like a series of mirrors where 
one could like trace what they saw uh, in front of them without having to look up. Uh, SS has created 500 paintings so far that are photo derived. And Estes started his career as a master of reflections and later became a master of bird's eye view. In all of his works, there's an exaggerated focus and an exaggerated lighting. If you see the below, you can tell that there's a huge exaggeration of the sunlight. Um, you can also see how detailed everything is in his, pain in his paintings. Even the bus seats and every, every stone in the cobblestone down there is so detailed. Uh, you can also tell from the painting below that most of the time iconic buildings are in his paintings but are not the focal point. Originally, Esta started with a first layer of acrylic paint and then painted over it in oil, mostly because painting in acrylic could be quicker than painting in oil, but he stopped doing this because he just doesn't like acrylic paint. Uh, he usually doesn't show dirt or decay in his paintings because simply because he doesn't think it's that easy to paint. Although you can see more dirt, more decay, and the sword in his new works, which just tend to be more imperfect. But overall, Estes' works appear to be idealizations of reality. Richard Estes once said, A thought about reflection is that what we are looking at isn't there. The tactile and the visual poetry do not coincide. The overlap. Since all objects reflect, perhaps you show how they are or how we think they are. That's pretty deep stuff there, Estes. Estes was greatly influenced by many of the works of art that surrounded him at the Art Institute in Chicago. Uh, while he was attending school, he would pass certain paintings going class to class. So, one of the paintings that inspired one of his works that we'll get to later is uh, Seurat's famous painting that you see on the direct right. I'm not going to attempt to say that in French, but I think we all know what that is. <laughs> uh, another one is A Rainy Day, which is the one on the top left, and Edward Hopper's Nighthawks, which is on the bottom left. Uh, another artist who inspired him, uh, or at least was going after the same themes as him, was Lee Freelander, and you can see one of his photographs there on the bottom right. Uh, both Freelander and Estes explored ideas about reflections and also shadows. Uh, they thought that reflections could be realer than the actual object. So if you look in Freelander's photograph, you can see a reflection on that glass, which is very typical also in Estes' works. Uh, with new updates in uh, photography, such as digital photography and Photoshop, <laughs> uh, Estes actually believes that these programs are making his work better and he's completely embraced them. Uh, he's a user of Photoshop. This is Estes' work, Candy Store, and some things you should note in this is uh, the reflections that he has on the shop window. Uh, you can see buildings reflected in it. You can see that Pepsi sign in the upper left reflected in it. And uh, also, not only can we see the reflections in that glass, but we can see into the store. We can see the lights going back through the store. Uh, this would be one of those perspective challenges, technical challenges that they often include in their work. 
obviously this is just one of the things that also make this photo realistic in addition to obviously the detail that he has put into this work if you were to go really close to this you could see almost as if every one of those bins full of candy had something in it like each piece seems almost to have its own value or shade um, if you think back to Lee Freelander, uh, the photographer that I mentioned two slides before, uh, you can see that he also was doing the same thing with reflections. Very similar to shop windows. Uh, just interesting things. Just a tidbit about Estes and how he would get things like streets or just buildings to appear empty. If you notice in this, it appears empty. There, there's no life going on in the scene. Uh, Estes would go out on Sunday mornings in New York and he would take pictures of the deserted buildings and streets because at that time a lot of people were in church, right? So <laughs> either in church or they were sleeping in. But that's how he did it. And uh, you might also want to note in this uh, that there is like a touch of pop culture in this. Okay, it's kind of hard to not notice that. I mean, if you look, there's the uh, what do you call that? The peanut. <laughs> What's his name? I don't know. He's on peanuts. All right, but there, there's that peanut, the planter's peanut, that's what he's calling something. All right, but there's also the Pepsi sign, and those are clear references to, you know, popular culture. Just something to know. Although Estes didn't associate with pop art and thought it was just pop, he, uh, it seems as if it was one of the things he had been influenced by. Pop art allowed him to move into this, and many photorealists to move into the photorealistic style. This is Estes's work, A Sunday Afternoon in the Park. Um, this was inspired by Seurat's famous painting of the same name, but in French, and I'm not going to attempt to say that again. So, things to note about this painting. Um, obviously, it's highly detailed if you just look at the rocks in front of you. Um, they look pretty realistic. And uh, another thing to notice is how the people are presented in this piece. Um, it's strange to see people in Estes's work, but um, they're really just secondary to the piece things that really are the subject are the uh, rocks that are immense in the size almost going and taking up half of the entire canvas and then your eye is drawn to the rocks and then moves back towards that cityscape in the background the sweeping skyline and then you're led back around to the front where you see the people but they're not they're not as detailed they don't appear to be as detailed and it's really unimportant that they're there um, in Surat's painting in comparison to this the people were the main focus they were the main subject it was interesting to look at what the people were doing and here it's very bland the people are uninteresting and they're presented in a way that makes them seem less important than the landscape that surrounds them. Um, yeah. Uh. This is Estes's work, The Automat. Uh, it was greatly inspired by Edward Hopper's painting of an automat called Nighthawks. I showed it a couple slides earlier. Um, besides the obvious subject matter of the 
of the painting itself, um, which is an auto mat. Um, the reflections that Estes uses in this work resonates with uh, Hopper's use of reflections in his work, Nighthawks. Uh, you can see the lights on the inside of the auto mat, and you can see light reflected in the windows of the auto mat. Uh, one of the interviews that I listened to, uh, some guy was analyzing this piece in particular, and he said that the lights look like spaceships. Now, I really don't understand where he was going with that, but just, I don't know. If you want to figure that out, go for it, but <laughs> I don't really see spaceships in this. I, I can see how it almost seems as if the lights are floating on the building, okay, that is reflected in the window, but yeah. Maybe that's what he was referring to. Um, one thing that's also possible that's just like Hopper's piece, Nighthawks, is that Estes may have been highlighting some sense of loneliness, okay? Um, if you look inside the automat, you can see that there's a man sitting alone at a table, and uh, there's also another person, possibly in the back booth there, like peeking out, kind of like a, what do you call it? What? <laughs> Just forget it. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, you can also see there's a person reflected in the window, walking down the sidewalk. Uh, so. And another thing is the grandeur of the buildings that are reflected greatly outweigh the subject of the automat itself. So that reflection is more important to us than what we can see right in front of us. And that that's something that Estes was exploring at the time. As well as Lee Freelander, who, if you remember from a couple slides before, had also taken pictures dealing with this reflection and what was important and how, what our reality was. And although Freelander and Estes both dealt with this idea of reflection, and they both knew it of each other, it was more of a coincidence that they were dealing with the same themes than a collaborative sort of idea. And uh, Don Eddy is known for exploring the nature and concept of reality and visual perception. Which is an exploration into metaphysics. You might be asking, what is metaphysics? Well, it is a traditional branch of ph philosophy concerned with explaining the fundamental nature of being and the world that encompasses it. It's important to note, though, that our example to the right is not a Don Eddy piece by any means that is, you know, surreal and it's just a piece that deals with metaphysics apparently. Whatever, whatever all that means, okay, we just put it up there. Um, but it's an example of it. So maybe our surrealist group can explain that. <laughs> and like for something to be metaphysics, you really have to answer like, what is ultimately there, and what is it like? So you really have to ask yourself about that painting. But also, Don Eddy utilized airbrush painting and thousand dots of color, which is really, that's the right word. It's really common in the photorealist photo styles. Um, he often composed more object-oriented pieces and he juxtaposed images in poetic relationship to another. In Don Eddy's Green Volkswagen, you can tell there's a lot of abstract qualities. And also, it's kind of weird how there isn't any life in the photo. Which I would like to argue, if you look at the handle of the Volkswagen, and just below it, 
it almost appears that you can see him reflected. Or a mailbox, either one. I don't think that's a mailbox. It looks like a mailbox. It looks like a guy wearing a dark shirt and light colored pair of pants. I don't know where you see that. But, um, in relation to the car, there's a lot of attachments to pop art since it's a very popular car. Yeah, I mean, I know this was a popular car design in the 70s, mm -hmm. I'm sure of very many pieces made about the Volkswagen Beetle. Um, but there's also, you know, that connection to metaphysics that we haven't talked about yet. And I would like to talk about it, because if, if you look at the car itself, you get a distorted reflection. It's a distorted version of reality. Now, I'm proposing, and I don't know if you agree with me, that he could be saying that our reality, what we perceive, is not what really is there, or what we can perceive is not true. See, I took it as our reality is warped because everything that's reflecting from it, well, of course, a reflection is going to curve, but everything has straight lines or like one color, but when you look at the reflection, everything's distorted. Also, something about this reflection and relation to metaphysics reminds me of something we learned in philosophy, which was about one of Plato's theories about the cave. Okay, so there's a cave, and there's people who have never seen the light of day, and they look at a wall in the cave, and all they can see are shadows that are just coming in from behind them. They can't turn around, obviously. And they believe that the shadows that they see on the cave walls to be reality. So perhaps he's suggesting that what we see in the reflection is not real, thus making our surroundings unreal. Uh, another abstract part of this could be the foreground of the, the tree shade, you know, shadow. Uh, the tree shadow looks like an abstract piece itself. I mean, uh, yeah. just random dots of color. And it makes, makes you ask, what is it? Yeah, it does. And Don Eddy's piece, Untitled. Four VWs. Um, I kind of have to argue with this about the focal point. My eye is drawn to the first two cars because they're most detailed and they really capture your attention. I'd agree that your eye is drawn to those cars, but I wouldn't agree that that would be the focal point. I think that what Don Eddy has done is he's created uh, three centros, cent central circles in the middle of the piece that being the headlights of the two cars in front, and then the wheel of that car parked behind all these cars, the four VWs, and it leads your eye directly to that wheel. I don't know. It's using rule of thirds, but... I see where you're coming from. Uh, we could also talk about the symmetry in this piece. Uh, the symmetry itself almost appears reflective in nature. Symmetry is reflective mm -hmm. and that goes back to what all the other photorealists were doing with uh, reflections as well, as says and uh, you know. But I feel like in this painting it's a different type of reflection. It's more like a mirrored reflection instead of having like lights being like if you see it through a building. If you know what I mean? It's like a true reflection. Yeah, it's the same object, just opposite. Now, the only thing that makes this seem not symmetrical, like completely, perfectly symmetrical, is which side of the car we're looking at, and the type at the top of the building there. Um, one thing about metaphysics is there's people that say that we shouldn't question our reality unless we find things that are imperfect in it. So technically, mm -hmm. in this piece, we're finding things that are not symmetrical, not lining up to our expectations, and thus we're questioning 
Like, yeah. is anything perfect? Yeah. But there's also like a theory that um, what moments in our own life and the sound that we hear just coincidentally line up. And I, this piece made me think of that because I thought it was more of a coincidence that these things would line up so perfectly. And just the reflective nature of, you know, having that sound that matches up perfectly with uh, the moment, something that occurs. And I, I don't know, this piece just made me think of that theory. Dwayne Hansen's works look to have viewers' perception of everyday subjects altered. In this piece of abortion, uh, this was the one piece where he realized that by making his sculptures bigger, uh, he could create a bigger impact. Uh, although, you know, obviously the subject matter of this is highly controversial. Mm -hmm. um, this is just one of those things that he's trying to bring attention to. Dwayne Hansen is not like other photorealists. He does want that uh, po the political side to enter his work. He wants people to pay attention to things they would otherwise ignore. And question it. So. And also, Dwayne Hansen, he made his work so that a relation just impressed the viewer, but you should also comment on the current human condition of it. And I think you could really feel these things in the 60s when th these certain pieces were created by Hansen. You know, when the photorealists were really starting to happen, I think that, you know, political issues, social issues really became quite the thing to highlight in artwork. Dwayne Hansen's early subject matter was taken from televised news, such as violence, crime, and death. And he also wanted to make viewers encounter firsthand situations they could, avo they could avoid by turning off the television. I think that was really smart to do because, I mean, some people think that art should get us talking. I mean, any art gets us talking. Even Estes, in his pieces, we talked about it. We talked about certain theories that you could derive from it. Although, you know, meaning in his work wasn't as important, but in Hansen's work, he did want the political side to show through. Like he, he literally brought it to life. Have a first-hand confrontation with what you didn't want to have a first-hand confrontation <laughs> with. There you go. Dwayne Hansen was born in Alexandria, Minnesota in 1925, and his father was a dairy farmer. I think this was important because blue-collar workers seem to be one of the things that are highlighted in much of Hansen's work. And uh, one of the things that I found that was a little bit eccentric about him as a child was uh, what he used to carve when he was a child. Uh, he made a piece called Boy in Blue, which is the earliest piece that they know of that they can find from him. Uh, it's supposed to be the same Boy in Blue that was in one of Gainsborough's pieces, but that's unimportant. Uh, one thing about Hanson when he was a kid is he would just find logs or broomsticks and he would carve them up and he would use things like his mom's butcher's knife to do this. Uh, his formal art training started in 1943 at Luther College, and he would later go to Cranbrook Academy of Art in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, and would graduate with his master's in fine art in 1951. He then moved to Germany to teach, and there he would discover polyester resin, and then he would move to Atlanta in 1960. After Atlanta, he moved to Greenwich Village from 1969 to 1973, and then moved to Florida, which is where he would gain his popularity. But 
New York made him realize that what he wanted to show. He, he did not just want to impress the viewer with authenticity, but to comment on the contemporary human condition, which is what we said. But it is in New York that he realized this. He realized isolation, loneliness, and alienation. And that's kind of ironic because you're in a city surrounded by millions of people, but yet you can feel so alone. And I think Hampson just realized that he was alone. Although he could have as many friends as he could, he was one single being, and that's all you could be. Um, before Hansen started doing photorealism, he was doing abstract art, abstract sculpture, and <laughs> there's a funny quote he said. He said, I think some of the worst sculpture ever produced was, in my opinion, done in the 50s. It's supposed to be based on form, but there's usually not much form. It's modern, but it, it isn't modern. Uh, and most likely he was talking about abstract expressionist paint, you know, the movement, abstract expressionism. But he also said that abstract, abstract sculptures are what he had to do before he could move on to uh, making these photorealist pieces. That it was a stepping stone to realizing this. And that's very similar to what Estes went through, that he had to realize through, you know, the abstract qualities of that time to make these photorealist pieces. Uh, he also commented on pop art because obviously he would encounter that in New York. He said about the pop artists Seagal and Krenholtz, uh, to me, they look dirty. Although I like all the pop artists, I think they're very good artists, all of them. I just think they're a little, for my taste, for what I would want to do anyways, a bit arty. So <laughs> he was very critical of them being arty. And that's reflected greatly in the photorealist movement, where they just wanted to take out all stylization in art. And that's one of the things that makes Dwayne Hansen a photorealist. He wanted to remove that. The sculpture is no more than what you would see in real life. It's a, a person. It's not about form. It's not about anything but who that person is. Dwayne Hansen once said, Realism is best suited to convey the frightening idiosyncrasies of our time. Dwayne Hansen's process of creating these pieces started with taking pictures of his models and he would have them pose and, you know, just do different things. Then <laughs> he shaved off their body hair and greased them with petroleum jelly. Sounds a little weird, but <laughs> That was just because he was about to apply a fast-setting silicone rubber reinforced with plaster of Paris. And he said that he, he said, I try to do it in less than three hours, one leg and then the other leg, up to the neck, the arms, the head. So he did this entire body casting in a matter of three hours, which is pretty incredible. But the entire piece, I don't think it <laughs> really took that. I think it took way longer. Uh, you'll see what I mean. After he made the body cast, he would remove the molds and he would repair the flaws. There's a picture of him doing just that. Uh, then he poured in a flesh-colored flesh polyester resin let that set, he released the mold, and then he would use soldering irons to fix any flaws or imperfections that occurred during this process. Then he would attach the parts, and he would assemble them from the feet up. So he had to balance these pieces as he was building them. So they're self-balanced, you know, they're standing by themselves. 
Ray and Hansen sometimes exchanged body parts between sculptures, which made the sculptures look unposed and natural. Which lent to the realness of the sculptures themselves. He also reworked surface and decided how the sculptures looked right and not to give the impression of being arranged. And he would just do this intuitively. He would intuitively think, hey, this is looking a little posed. Maybe I ought to change it. So, Dwayne Hansen, there you go. Dwayne Hansen painted sculptures exaggerating light and shade. He used oils and acrylics and later exper experimented with materials such as crayons and nail polish. He also inserted tufts of hair from wigs using a needle, acrylic eyes, and clothing from thrift shops or models. In an interview with Dwayne Hansen, uh, the interviewer had asked, do you go out and buy clothes for the figures? Obviously we just said this is yes, but this is what Dwayne Hansen had to say. Sometimes, especially when you have something as large as that fat lady over there, could be any one of his pieces, <laughs> I have to go to great lengths to buy them. This lady vacuuming is my aunt. Those are clothes she actually wears. She gave me those. Otherwise, you just pick the clothing up at a thrift shop. So, sometimes his models would give him the clothes off their backs to use on his pieces. And this would create the illusion of reality, that these were actual people. Dwayne Hansen once said, the subject matter I like best deals with the familiar lower and middle class American types of today. Pop art opened up using everyday subjects. George Seagal, uh, this was the man that he criticized for being too arty, uh, him in particular, but he is synonymous with the pop art movement. Um, his piece, Race Riot, which showed four black men and three white men fighting, caused a neighbor of his to call the police. And this is kind of like Warhol's Red Race Riot, but Warhol's piece failed to trigger a physical response like that of Hansen's. So he really brought the viewer to that scene, whereas Warhol could not. And you look to the left, that is Warhol's Red Race Riot. His extremeness developed other artists' interests in material illusions, such as Marilyn Levine and Dan Duke. If you look to your right, that's a Marilyn Levine piece. No. That's not actually made out of leather. That's made out of some other materials that have been brought together to appear as if they are leather. And I believe that we had it earlier in this slideshow. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were just debating what this piece is called, but uh, it's someone's coat. Tom's coat, Larry's coat. Could be Bob's coat. Could be Bob's coat. Uh, but anyways, that's how she names her pieces. Just a fun fact for you. This is Hanson's piece, Race Riot. This is the one that he originally had in his front yard. Yeah, imagine putting this in your front yard. <laughs> Uh, but his neighbor had called the police because it looked so realistic. Uh, but if you just look at it, this is not something people would want to watch on their televisions or even encounter in real life. The violence of it, the drama of the situation, just it's something that people failed to encounter, that avoided in the 60s. And he just wanted people to see this. He made it unavoidable. And another thing is, you know, unlike pop art and what it did, uh, although this was, you know, a huge topic at the time, a huge topic, race relations, but this is of no specific event. This is just what he called race riot. And that's exactly what it is. Uh, he presents us with known one person that we can tell distinctly from another, like 
we can't name someone in there. Uh, they're regular people. They're everyday people. These are people that you could see on the street, that you could meet in real life. This is Dwayne Hansen's Queenie too. Um, Queenie is simply just a janitor. Uh, this is really just Dwayne Hansen highlighting that working class individual, the everyday person. And personally, I believe he was really inspired uh, to do this by his father. His dad was that dairy farmer, and he saw the blue collar worker. And the blue collar worker was the unsung hero. Uh, in pop art, the celebrities and the stars were the heroes. They were the subject matter. And in here, he goes and he says, that these are the people that we should look at, the people we should recognize, is the people that we are surrounded with. This is the real reality. This is Dwayne Hansen's Tourist too. I really like this piece because he's using ordinary people as a subject matter. I mean, these people are people that Hanson would probably see in his everyday life in Florida. Just look at how they're dressed. Uh, also, he had a piece called, I believe it was just Tourist, and it used to be in the Tampa airport. And it was so realistic that people used to approach it and uh, try to ask questions or, you know, just start to try and ask things. And they would be shocked to find out that it was not actually a person. Uh, the quote that I found while reading up on Hansen was uh, about a man that used to run a gallery which had uh, Hansen pieces. He said, I once observed a gallery visitor approach a Hansen sculpture of a seated gray-haired secretary taking dictation and ask her a question about the exhibition. When no answer was forthcoming and it, the visitor realized she had been fooled, she caught me looking at her and she left the gallery in embarrassment. Now, <laughs> that was not irregular by any means in Hansen's works. And it was actually many collectors would not even buy Hansen's sculptures because they were afraid to live with them. <laughs> uh, and those that did buy them just did them to scare visitors to their house. So, uh, to, end, to end this, I would like to say that Hansen said, um, I'm not duplicating life, I'm making a statement about human values. And I think that transcends all of his works. Um, Dwayne Hansen was diagnosed with cancer, and he died of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, 70 years old, in 1971. And it's very likely that the polyester resin and the fiberglass that he worked with his entire life caused it. So, his art killed him. It was more of a style than a movement, for its practitioners worked independently in a variety of media with individual subject matter. Benjamin Pinocchio. Uh, he's talking about photorealism, and I can't deny that they worked independently, but all their work accumulated to talk about the same things for the most part. Uh, the guy was kind of a jerk. Uh, from what I read on the New York Times article he wrote about uh, one of Dwayne Hansen's things, but he talked about photorealism overall. He said, it sounds like pop art, you say. Perhaps, but what's missing is the irony, the sense that the artists are knowingly working with cliché in a way that seeks to question or undermine, or that there is some deeper thought. You never get this feeling looking at photorealist painting which always feels like empty celebration, or when it dabbles with illusionism, a kind of cheap magic trick. So, he is not impressed at all with the photorealists, and mounts them down to a cheap magic trick. Everyone is entitled to their own opinion. <laughs> Photorealists were criticized for being copiers instead of artists. 
They, criticize, they are criticized for being corny and superficial. And many collectors, curators, and critics are skeptical about photorealism. Neiman Chuck Close argued that work may have been based on the camera, but it was in the hand of the artist that made it.